Hey, Dave Hagen here. Is there anything you can do to pay off some of that debt in big chunks so that you can get to your goal of being debt-free faster? We're going to talk about that today on the Financial Wellness Podcast. Welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. Here is your host, financial problem solver and talk show host, Dave Hagan. Hey, thanks, Nick. As you might remember, a few podcasts ago, I laid out my five steps to financial freedom. For those of you that didn't hear, the steps are one, get rid of the cards, two, know your flow, three, eliminate debt immediately, four, create an emergency fund, and five, put 15% uh, towards retirement. Today, we're going to talk about step number three, eliminate debt, but this is the third of three podcasts on this topic. So if you haven't heard the previous two, go back and listen to those. We've talked about three different methods to pay off debt. We also talked a little bit about the psychological aspects of paying off debt. Last time, we talked about ways to increase income and decrease expenses. Today, I want to talk about what I consider to be the money shot. That is, ways to generate extra money that doesn't necessarily come along every month to chunk down the debt. Let me give you a few ideas. First, think about selling excess stuff. Many of us have a garage or boxes that are full of things we don't use anymore. Collectively, they can generate a nice little piece of change. Clean out the garage, have a garage sale, and apply all of the money to reducing debt. If you've got something that's especially nice, sell it on Craigslist. You might be able to get a few more bucks for it. Think about taking out old jewelry that you don't want or don't need and redeem it for cash. Use that money to pay down the debt. It's amazing how much stuff, just stuff, stuff, stuff that we have sitting around the house. Why not turn it into cash and help use that money to get you to where you want to be? Second, what about using savings to pay down debt? People ask me all the time, should I use savings to pay down debt? The simple answer is yes. Now, remember, I consider savings to be a very precious thing. But if you can use a savings account to pay down debt, I would do it. But don't use your emergency fund to pay down debt. We'll talk about emergency funds next week. But if you're fortunate enough to already have an emergency fund, don't use that to pay down debt. Usually an emergency fund is two to six months of expenses. But if you have a choice to have some money in the bank earning 2%, or using that money to pay off debt that's accruing interest at 17%, it seems to me the answer is pretty clear. Now, what about borrowing against your 401k plan? Generally, I'd say, no, don't do this. Only do this if you're 99.9% sure that you're going to be able to pay off all your debt. If you have any doubt, don't sacrifice your retirement fund. The reason for this is that money in a 401k is generally protected from claims of creditors. There's actually a U.S. Supreme Court opinion on this issue. If you need to file bankruptcy later, you get to keep all the money in your retirement accounts. So it's never considered a good idea to borrow against money that's protected to pay creditors that you could potentially discharge in a bankruptcy. That being said, if you have a good plan that you believe in, you may go against the general rule and borrow against the 401k. Incidentally, if you borrow against your plan, the interest that you pay on the money that you borrow will ultimately accrue to your benefit. This is because the retirement plan will just be that much bigger when you start going into it and you retire. What about borrowing against assets? This might be a good idea, but you've got to run the numbers. Borrowing against a car that's free and clear is usually not a good idea. There's all sorts of places that are in business all of a sudden that will loan you money against your car title. However, the interest rates are usually something that's not in your best interest. What about borrowing against your house? This might be a good idea. If you refinance and put 100% of the money you take out to pay off your debt, which is at a higher interest rate, and you'll be paying off over 30 years and the payment rate is lower, 
Okay, maybe that's not such a bad deal. But remember, you're resetting the 30-year meter on your house loan. In limited circumstances, you might think about doing this. But better yet, maybe refi for a term that's the same term as your current loan. If your current loan has 17 years left, then ask that the new loan have 17 years on it. This way, you don't start the 30-year clock going all over again. Now, this would also be a short way to get through the third step of your five-step program because you'd be able to retire all of the debt immediately, even though you're going to take some of that money and put it on your, your house loan. What about debt consolidation? What's that all about? When you consolidate your debts, you turn all your debts over to a company. They then take the calls from the creditors and make the payments. You need to then make one large payment to them each month so that they can cover all of these bills and their fee. This kind of arrangement is best for people that have a whole bunch of bills and have trouble managing the payment of them each month on a timely basis. However, you need to pay the consolidator each month, so you're effectively paying someone to pay your bills. If your bills are greater than your income, this obviously doesn't work for you, and it's one of the reasons that I'm not that big of a fan. You might also think about a debt settlement company. Now, at first, this sounds great because they claim that they'll get you settlements for 10 to 20 cents on the dollar. However, what they don't tell you is you have to stop paying all your credit cards. No creditor is going to settle with you if your accounts are current. When you stop paying, your credit score immediately starts to degrade. When you're four to six months delinquent, they call up and offer a lump sum settlement. Now, that's good because you're paying less than the full amount, but it creates some issues. First, you need to figure out where you're going to come up with this lump sum to settle. Creditors won't reduce the amount and then take payments. If they're going to reduce the amount, it's a one-time lump sum. Further, a lump sum settlement is not that good for your credit report. Now, having a great credit report is not necessarily one of the most important things in your financial life, but if you can avoid your credit report degrading, I guess that's a good thing. Finally, settling for less than the full amount due could lead to tax issues when you file your return next year. So there's some downsides here. In some instances, a lump sum settlement approach to reducing debt might work and it actually might be your best option. However, you need to talk with somebody about it because there are some downsides to this. I advise people to think long and hard before believing all the promises that these debt settlement companies make. What about borrowing money from family? Now, I know some people advocate this approach. I'm not a fan. I think family relationships are difficult enough without inserting more issues into them. Obviously, if you've got a family member that's well-to-do and they're foolish enough to loan you money at a low interest rate, yeah, why not? Consider it. You then pay them back over some period of time and avoid the higher interest rate on the credit cards. However, if I was representing the family member who's making the loan, I'd probably recommend against it simply because it's family and usually there's no collateral for the loan. And at the end of the day, if the family member doesn't pay, what are you going to do? Sue them? Boy, that makes for an interesting holiday season. And what about bankruptcy? A Chapter 7 bankruptcy typically only lasts for four months and you end up with your debts being discharged. While this might seem a great idea at first blush, it does involve cost and risk and damage to your credit report. However, if you don't have any assets that you might otherwise lose, sit down with the bankruptcy attorney, pay them a fee so that they'll take time to listen to what you're saying and not simply try to sell you on a bankruptcy. See what they think. As a general rule of thumb, when your debt equals your annual income, you might want to start thinking about Chapter 7 bankruptcy. A Chapter 13 bankruptcy is kind of different. It's still a bankruptcy, but it's a repayment of debts. There, an individual repays their debts in full or in part over a period of three to five years. In certain circumstances, Chapter 13 can be very powerful. If someone owes past due mortgage payments or past due taxes, a Chapter 13 can allow them to repay under the protection of the bankruptcy court. However, if you're just paying off unsecured debt, Chapter 7 is often the better remedy. Again, consult with an attorney who does this all day long who can give you some honest feedback and advice. So there you have it. Some additional ways to reduce debt in chunks. These are the money shots, if you will, and should be made on top of the monthly payment reduction plan that you already set up in the previous step. If you do both at the same time, you're going to get to your financial goal just that much quicker. You're going to become the master of your own money. This is Dave Hagan. 
and you're listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on the road to financial success. If you'd like Dave to answer any of your questions, email them to dave at davidrhagen.com. If you like the podcast, you can subscribe to the podcast by hitting the subscribe button in your app. You will automatically get a reminder each time Dave uploads a new episode. Or you can use the app to share this episode with your friends and family. Let's listen in now as Dave answers some emails. Hey, we're back. Nick, what do you got for me today? Hey, Dave. So I have an email from Carol. And Carol says, hey, Dave, I'm a single mother of three. I have a decent job, and I'm doing pretty good at providing for my family. Unfortunately, I have accumulated about $20,000 on four credit cards over the past five or so years. The payments are now starting to kill me. They total almost $800 per month. I recently got a credit card application for $20,000. Better yet, it offers no interest for one year. Should I get a cash advance on this card to pay off the older cards? Thanks for any advice you can provide, Carol. Wow, Carol, first of all, you're doing a good job providing for your family. Good for you. I think that's phenomenal. Um, So the question is, should you get a cash advance that has no interest for a year to pay off current credit card debt? No. Wow, I don't know. Um, The thought would be that you pay off all of that before the interest starts to accrue on that cash advance. If you think you can do it in the next year before the interest starts to accrue, yeah, maybe you think about it. But if you're not sure, don't. Because usually cash advances have a higher interest rate. And that interest rate will be applied retroactively if you don't pay the debt off in full. So you're really stepping up to the cliff. And I don't want you to fall off the cliff. But if you think that you can in a limited circumstance... Maybe that's something that you want to do. But boy, you really, you really got to be careful. You know, I was looking at some statistics the other day of the amount of money that, that uh, credit card companies make on um, cash advances. And they make like four times as much money on cash advances than they do on late fees. So that it, this is a very, very lucrative business for the credit card companies. And you've got to be extremely careful about doing that. I like to say, show me someone that's cash advancing and I'll show you someone that's going to be financially terminal here pretty quick. It's dangerous stuff. But in this limited circumstance, if you're completely committed to having it paid off in full, in fact, maybe not even within the period, but early within the period, Maybe that makes sense. Go ahead and, and go ahead and do that. Make sure that all your financial information that you give them is, is correct so that if it doesn't work out and you need to seek bankruptcy protection at some point, they don't turn around and say, well, you defrauded us with false financial uh, uh, data. So do it straight up. Make sure you pay it off early. I think that that um, makes some sense. But boy, be careful. Be careful, Carol. All right. What do we got? Another one, Nick? Yeah, Dave, we have one from Lisa. It says, Dave, my husband and I both work making about $120,000 together. We owe about $60,000 in student loans. We rent our home and we just had our first child. We both have cars with monthly payments. Should we start saving money, put money in retirement accounts, or pay the student loans? Please advise, Dave. Thanks, Lisa. Wow, Lisa. I think what I would do would be to pay off the student loans. Um, I hate to say that because, uh, you you know, you've already got the benefit of the education and it seems to be working because you're making good money. Um, And sometimes student loan debt doesn't seem like real debt now that you're out in the working world. But uh, um, I think I'd pay down the student loan debt. I think your income is phenomenal. The two of you uh, should be congratulated on that. Um, I'd be interested to know what you pay on the cars because sometimes people are paying too much cars when they start to enjoy an, an income. I sat down with a, um, a family, a, a couple, um, a couple months ago, and they were both paying $1,200 a month on a car. And I said, wow, you guys, you got to do something about that. That's $2,400 a month running out the door. And then we factored in insurance on those expensive cars and gasoline and tags. And before he knew it, 30, 40% of their income was going to pay these cars and, and they didn't realize it. They had a couple of nice cars, but they didn't realize it. And one of the things that we talked about was, um, gee, when one of these is paid off, maybe you drive it around or maybe you even sell it when it's paid off and get a lesser car. 
You know, I think people are starting to rethink their financial needs for a family. It used to be that a family would have two really nice cars that could go anywhere, anytime, do anything. But people are starting to rethink that. Maybe one of the cars is a better car that can drive longer and the other car is a lesser car just to go to the market and go to a job that's a little bit closer. So a, a, a bigger, stronger car that can go somewhere on the weekend and a lesser car just to get around town. Or maybe even one car that's gasoline that can go all over California or the Western United States if you live in L.A. And the second car that's electric that will take you to the market and back or to the barber shop and hairdresser and back and that kind of thing. So I think people are are rethinking that. In fact, I know somebody that um, had no second car. She worked three miles to the office. And you know what she did every day? She called Uber. And it turns out to go three miles to work and back every day was cheaper than a second car with the payments, with the tags, with the gas, with the payment, and all the other things that go with that. And they actually were saving a bunch of money, and she was showing up at work like some kind of celebrity sitting in the back seat. By the way, I love to drive in the back seat with Uber. I feel so fancy. It's great. <laughs> but I think that people are rethinking these needs, and I think that that's, that's good. I see so many people spending so much on their transportation costs, and it, it's really unfortunate. So I think that you're really in a pretty good spot, but you need to start working on those student loans. It used to be that student loans were 2 or 3% loans. I know that mine were like 1% loans. Of course, that was quite a while ago. And, um, uh, you know, now they're, they're running off at 8 9%. They're very dangerous, very dangerous. Remember, at 7%, debt will double in 10 years. So while you're paying down or if you've got them on deferment and they're running off at, at 7%, that money is going to double in 10 years. Don't let that happen. Attack those loans. Attack those loans viciously to pay them off so that you can become the master of your money once again. All right, that's all the time that we have for today. That was an interesting, I enjoyed that. Well, do we have time for one more, Nick? Nope. Unfortunately, we're out of time, Dave. Well, all right. All right. So let's wrap it up. Hey, next week, we're going to talk about creating an emergency fund. And I know what some of you are thinking, what? An emergency fund? But it's time now. It's time to put that together. So come back and listen to us next week when we talk about an emergency fund. This is Dave Hagan, and you're listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on the road to financial success. If you'd like Dave to answer any of your questions, email them to dave at davidrhagan.com. Until next week, this is your announcer, Nick Appel, wishing you every financial success.